So let's talk about darolutamide for, for a second here. Um, a couple of us mentioned the error note trial. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, um, uh, data was recently <coughs> released. What, what stood out to you about the error note trial, which was, you know, the darolutamide trial for metastatic castrate sensitive prostate cancer? When you read that trial, what were your, what, what kind of piqued your interest? Love the toxicity, obviously, right? I mean, whether it's because it's a really different molecule and, and much different than its competitors, um, whether it crosses the blood brain barrier or not, all that stuff. I think that, that cognitive component for our patients is key, both in younger guys and older guys, so I love that. I love the reduction in um, radiographic progression-free survival and things like that. I think it's gonna be great. Hopefully we get good overall survival data. Um, and then again, I think it's just gonna be a side effect profile issue. We know everything we give these men with advanced prostate cancer kind of makes them feel bad. So, and if we're stacking drug on drug on drug, I wanna stack whatever is gonna have the lowest overall negative toxicity for that patient. I think Darrow is gonna be that drug, so. Yeah, I totally agree. When you look at Aeronote and look at some of the subset analysis, especially the AE profile, yeah. I mean, some of the, in the treated arm, you know, some of the, you know, the uh, AEs were less in the treated right. arm, right. Um, which is always impressive. Right. And the nice thing about Aeronote was it involved all comers. Right. High risk, low risk, exactly. visceral, non-visceral, ECOG, they even included, old, you know, above 85, right. ECOG 2. So it seems to be, you know, that drug that's best tolerated. And Aeronote essentially just proved that it, it can be sure. used in anyone. Yeah, so for the young guy who's still working, and needs to live a full life, or some of the older guys who were worried about that toxicity that are still active, <coughs> I think it's perfect for that. And we always joke about this when we look at the, the uh, P, you know, the uh, inserts or the drug inserts, right. the DD, the list of DDRs right. for right. for um, darolutamide is is minimal. Minimal. And some of these drugs, when you look at it and you really dig into mm -hmm. them, they could be pages long. So, um, you know, darolutamide was one of the first drug after 20 drugs that showed in combination with docetaxel to be safe. So there's, so to your point, there's something said about the molecule and, and what, what, what this, uh, the data shows. Let's talk a little bit about identifying patients with high risk, you know, patients that are high risk for, for disease. Um, in patients with, with localized prostate cancer, oh, that's you, Josh, yeah. the young guy here. Yeah, yeah. So how, how do you identify high risk in patients um, who are MCSPC. Who is the patient in the MCSPC patient population that you're worried about and at risk for CRPC progression? Yeah. How do you identify that patient? So again, going back to a lot of clinical factors, I think play a huge role in that. Um, and especially now with uh, the recommendation of upfront germline testing and somatic testing, I think that's gonna be the huge driving force moving forward um, as we learn more and more about the disease progress of prostate cancer and getting a better understanding of which molecules, whether it be you know P10, P53, RB1, I think those are gonna be huge drivers in which where you, know, you select the 50 year old who has less risky cancer versus those that have higher risk cancer. And so, but for me, as of right now, um, utilizing those tools, I think, is, is going to be the biggest key. So, you, so it, when you have a patient with advanced disease, you're checking germline. Correct, yeah. And you're checking somatic mm -hmm. testing, mm -hmm. and that really helps you decide yeah. how, how aggressive you want to be with this patient. It, it plays a key role in it, I believe, yeah. No, I think that's, that's a strong point. Anyone else use any other factors to determine, you know, who's at risk for MCRPC? I mean, if you go to latitude, right, it's like Gleason 8 or greater, multiple Mets, you know, significant amount of bone Mets. I think all of those things make us worried. Um, I don't know that we see a lot of guys with Gleason 6 with multiple metastatic sites. Right. So mo <laughs> most of these guys have Gleason 8, 9, or 10. You get that occasional 7 maybe that's that way. Um, but again, I think just like, like Josh said, it was a good point, but they have that Gleason 8 and, and the number of Mets that we see and where they are as well. What about PSA? There's a lot of literature looking at PSA response, PSA 90, yeah. Yeah. PSA 50. Yeah. Do you incorporate, you know, PSA response into, you know... A presentation or, or response to it? Response to, let's say you start a yeah. patient on doublet therapy, 
Do you do you think P, do you use PSA response? You know, deep PSA response, PSA ninety or PSA fifty? Does any of that? Yeah, I think that's it, useful. You know, it's been shown that uh, the the ones that take longer to respond, uh, PSA response, uh, their recurrence is uh, higher. Mm -hmm. So there, there's data in that, in that regard. Yes. Yeah, I think that's one of the, one of the things I like to talk about is hope for our patients because you know, these guys are all living longer and longer. And so you know, you sit with that MCS MCSPC patient and their family and you know, maybe, maybe one of our non-oncologic partners said, well, I don't know, it looks pretty bad for you. And they come see us, we're like, hey, you're gonna do great. Mm -hmm. And we're gonna lay this out in the future. Um, and so we're just trying to get them to understand all this and, and lay that out and, and tell them about, again, all this. And I say, look, at a year, we want your PSA to basically be zero. And if it's zero at a year, meaning you know, we've had you on multiple modality therapy, your PET scan looks great, your PSA is basically undetectable or under one, I think it's a huge indicator um, that they're going to, I think it's a huge indicator they're going to do well for a long time. And again, that's where that PSA 90 data comes in. So I use it and I think it makes, you know, we joke PSA stands for patient stimulating anxiety or physician stimulating anxiety, but I, I believe it, especially in those patients at a year, it, that PSA really needs to be low. Yeah, and I think it's, it's helpful in my clinic because it shapes that conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, if a, if a patient has a poor response, their PSA doesn't zero out, yeah. the way you talk to that patient is going to be different than Correct. the guy who zeroed out, his pet's negative, and it's just like, you know you're going to get five, four or five good years yep. uh, of control. But uh, there's a classic line that I stole from you, Ken, um, and this is, has been very helpful as I talk to patients in the clinic, is that, you know, when they come all depressed, they have advanced prostate cancer, they're dying of their disease, mm -hmm. <coughs> You know, when actually, you know, the first thing I'll say is, you know, we have treatments. Um, unfortunately, I can't cure you. I don't have a shot or pill to cure you. You know, they, you know, they take a deep breath. But I think what the line that I use is this is similar to diabetes. This is similar to high blood pressure. We, we can't cure those diseases. We put you on pills and medicine mm -hmm. and your patients do fine. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing we're, we're doing in prostate cancer now is we can't cure them but we taken a, d a lethal disease with advanced in therapies and made it a chronic disease um, so these patients can live long with a high quality of life. Yeah, and I think that first discussion is so critical because I know all of us see second, third, fourth consults from various people and, and they are kind of upset. And then, you know, a year later, when that PSA does zero out and their scans look good, they're like, Doc, you were right. And then, you know, we just tell them the longer they live, the more new great things are gonna be out there and you know, Renee and I were just talking about one of my patients that basically has been in a hospice almost like 15 years, and he just got another new drug that we're going to talk about, lutetium, and uh, he's doing great again. So I think really what we sell is education to our patients. We really sell them hope, though, that look, you, if given the right circumstances and we give, we kind of layer in the right things and not miss anything, it's going to be a disease of chronicity, which is what we want.